Finding the right jeans is hard. Accepting your jeans is even harder. Whether you wear boyfriend or boot cut, high rise or low rise, this podcast will teach you to love the jeans you are in. I'm Rachel. And I'm Tina. And we're going to use modern research to bust diet myths and get real about body after baby. We're going to take you on a journey of unpacking your old beliefs about food and weight so you can learn to nourish your body and raise body confident kids. So put your booty in a chair and let's talk mom jeans. This episode you're about to listen to has a few choice words. So if you're listening with your children in the car, earmuffs. Thank you. All right, everyone. Welcome to Mom Jeans. Today we are talking all about the belly. And today we decided to try something different. So some of you are going to geek out and love all of the science and all of the research that we're about to pour into your earbuds. And some of you are going to be like, eh, not interested. I only like the interviews and the chit chat. So we're going to go ahead and give you a episode that is Tina and I discussing a lot of research and a lot of reasons why we believe that education is really helpful for the body acceptance movement and for just internal body acceptance as well. So feel free to give us some feedback either online or in our email on what you like, what you want to hear more of, what you would love for us to touch on. We'd love to hear back from our listeners. Also, could you do us a huge favor and go on to wherever you listen to your podcasts, specifically iTunes if possible, and could you drop us a review and give us some stars? It really, really helps new listeners find us. The more re- reviews we have, the more iTunes bumps our podcast up. So if you don't mind doing that, we would really, really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So today, like I said, we're going to talk about a challenging piece of body acceptance for some of us, and that is the belly. We just want to throw in a disclaimer here that this episode may be triggering for those that are newly in recovery or are still in the beginning stages of their body acceptance journey. We do talk a lot about some facts in the middle of this episode that really might be too overwhelming for some listeners ears okay rachel take it away statistics show that 71 percent of women and 63 percent of men are dissatisfied with the appearance of their abdomens our society blatantly sells women's attractiveness in the form of a flawless flat stomach with just a touch of abs and anything less than that is immediately sold ab workouts one piece ruched bathing suits and mom jeans i mean Our entire podcast is a play on the term mom jeans because this is where the stigma of the mom bodies really started. Yes. So we are going to dive into a bit of fun before we get into the nitty gritty of facts. So here's a brief history of mom jeans. In the 70s and 80s, they were sold as just plain jeans that were high waisted, tight on top and looser in the legs. Moms flocked to them because... Good old Cindy Crawford was modeling them, and they were the newest fashion. As times changed and straight-legged, low-rise jeans came into fashion, the only people remaining wearing those jeans were, dun da da moms. <laughs> and mom jeans were born. Rachel, do you remember your mom jeans from the 80s? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes. I mean, my mom would, like, tuck her shirt into the high-waisted jean and wear the fanny pack on top. <laughs> I no. think I, yeah, I think I have some like epic pictures of my mom with me at Disneyland in like 1985. I'm gonna have to try to unearth. Yes. Oh my goodness! And of course, advertising is the reason why moms bought these. Thanks, Cindy Crawford. She was a hot mama back then. And then when we went to the low rise, I remember mom being like, I can't wear those low line jeans. I don't want like my underwear sticking out and like, heaven forbid, like the thong hanging out. Like that was just not what moms were into. So they stuck with the mom jeans. At least my mom did. Right. I don't know what who is really into the thong hanging out. But, you know, Um, the teens of the 90s, I think. Okay. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I think that was I think that was a thing. 
So, yeah, I mean, I think that this is where the stigmatization of the mom bod came because then the mom jeans got mocked and really it became this focus on the abdomen being like softer, rounder, bulging or whatever you want to call it, which makes it challenging for women to embrace their midsection as they age because, I mean, let's face it, I don't want to be the butt of a joke and I'm sure no one else does either. Yeah, thanks to social media, magazines, gender norms, diet culture, and our sexualized culture, girls as young as elementary school are becoming self-conscious about their stomach. That makes me so sad. Teens and girls on dates don't want to eat in front of their peers to keep a flat stomach. I hear that all the time in session. And moms feel pressured to get back into their pre-baby jeans weeks after having a baby, which is absolutely ridiculous. And if that isn't possible and doesn't happen, which thank goodness it really doesn't, they feel bad about it. And it's all just really insanely challenging for any female of any age to figure out how to accept the belly. It's interesting you talked about young girls. My daughter was just having a play date. They're both six and they were playing in the sprinklers in the backyard and they both put on their little two-piece bathing suits and were posing for pictures licking popsicles and it was just so cute but as I snapped that picture oh my goodness it just hit me like they're so innocent right now and I'm dreading the day where they start being aware of their midsections and the bathing suits but just think about it if you continue down this path spreading education and keeping her home very safe then she has a better chance of growing up with that body positivity you know, and we also can't protect her from every inch of everything because she is going to get exposed to it. We all are exposed to it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So as you guys can tell, I mean, this is a topic, an area of our physique that we could go on and on about. So we're actually going to split it into two episodes. Today's episode will be focused on our genes with a G, the internal genetic components of belly acceptance and education. And next week's episode will be focused on our genes with a J, the external components of belly acceptance. And we're even going to chat with another mama about her own journey. I know our podcast is called Mom Genes, but not all of our listeners are moms and not all of our mom listeners experience pregnancies to become moms. So we decided to touch on four common concerns women commonly have with their bellies that they wonder if they can control or if it's just their genetic makeup and give you some education and tips on what to do next. So just to give you a heads up, the five areas today will be bloating, hormones, belly fat, busting the myth of melting your belly fat, and of course, our closing statement is going to be all about body acceptance. And my children are currently wrestling downstairs, so my apologies (laughs) of the background noise. (laughs) This is a true mom's podcast. Here we go. And they wrestle without their shirts on, so it's all about just letting their bellies hang out while they pummel each other. It's really (laughs) actually perfect for today's episode. All right, so those are our five areas. Feel free to listen straight through, skip around, but those are going to be our five areas today. And just to give you a little background on why we sometimes do episodes all about education and the research behind these areas, I love this quote by Columbia University. It says, education develops in us a perspective of looking at life. And that totally sums up why Tina and I are so passionate about giving you the science, education, and resources behind the mom bod. Because the more you know, the more your perspective can change. I mean, diet culture doesn't give us an education. It just gives us fear mongering, stigmatizations, and lots of judgment. So body acceptance, or even better, body liberation, is steeped in education and perspective taking. So with that being said, we're going to dive in. Okay, Tina, can you get us started on some education on what is bloating and how does digestion affect our stomach size? Yes, one of my favorite topics. I love talking about bloating, intestines, and poop. So here we go. It's a good thing you're the dietitian, not (laughs) me. So I hear a lot about bloating from my clients. Literally, I'm going to talk like my grandpa. If I had a nickel for every time (laughs) a client came in. They literally come into my office all the time saying that they are experiencing bloating and thinking that food is the cause. And as a result, they end up cutting out that food, going on a diet, or thinking that they need to lose weight to solve this bloating. So I want to debunk some of these myths. Bloating is actually the feeling of your belly feeling swollen after eating or drinking. 
It is usually caused by excess gas in the stomach or an altered digestive system. There's about 16 to 30 percent of people reporting that they feel bloated. This can be caused by a multitude of things, and most often it has nothing to do with the food itself. So my common finding most often is that people just aren't eating enough nutrition and as a result, they need to restructure restructure their eating and eat more. Okay, so since I'm not the dietitian, you're saying that bloating is most commonly because people aren't eating enough nutrition? Because, I mean, I'm sure people usually want you to tell them, like, what food they need to cut out or start quoting things about gut health and inflammation. So, I mean, I know if I went to an RD, I'd be scared and hopeful in this weird combination that I'll get like a blueprint to like heal all my stomach issues from the outside and the inside. But really, you're kind of saying it's about they're not eating enough. Exactly. Very rarely do I ever give someone a meal plan or meal guide because they're coming in for bloating. Most often the bloating is really just because they have restricted out that specific food and it's actually very necessary for their body's equilibrium and nutrition stability. So If you get anything from this episode, I hope it would be to please really just make sure that you're eating enough nourishment. So important. And furthermore, people need to have more variety, making sure that they are eating enough, not restricting out specific food groups, and be drinking plenty of water. And also, let's not forget about stress. I mean, stress has a major impact on how you feel in your body and how digestion can feel. Stress management can go a long way. Simple but also challenging skills like meditation or yoga can really go a long way just to heal that equilibrium. Yeah, I have a few dietitian friends that actually incorporate yoga into their practice because it has that much of a positive effect on stress, anxiety, and digestion. You are D pals. Know who you are and thank you for your amazing work. Virtual wink at you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wink. <laughs> I want to point out that there's a lot of research that shows that the practices of yoga, meditation, deep breathing really have a massive effect on our digestion. And, you know, there's research to back that. So if you're looking for more information on that, there are dietitians out there that also are yoga um, certified in yoga that can help you on that journey. Or just work with a therapist on some meditation and breathing techniques also. Another, do you breathe in session, Rachel? Do you know, do you teach people how to breathe? I mean, we talk about, we talk about guided meditation, visualization, things like that. Overall, yeah. I mean, people love, again, to talk about like inflammation and bloating. It's probably due to some, I don't know, food group or whatever. And they food, start chucking yeah. up the gluten stuff, you know? But yeah, a big piece of this is just this overall concept. I like how you use the word nourishment. I mean, nourishment, like we've talked about in previous episodes, is a mind-body connection. It's all about mental health. It's about physical health. It's about spiritual health. It's about emotional health. So having your body really be in sync is a key component to healing any of your digestive issues. Exactly. So another common flaw is that people use the word bloating and really they are just retaining water. Most often they have not consumed enough water and therefore their body is reacting by holding on to more water. I know it feels counterintuitive, but it actually happens. Or they had a higher salt meal and therefore are retaining water. Simple solution to both of these issues, drink more water. <laughs> so Rachel, can you cover a few things that contribute to people feeling more bloated? Sure. Now, look, like we kind of just gave a disclaimer about, we want to throw out there that we're not in any way giving out specific recommendations, and most of this is just generalized education. So please don't take anything personally and specific to you. If you're really experiencing some of these symptoms, we would recommend meeting with a weight-inclusive doctor or dietitian or therapist that can assess you further. Okay, so this one's a little far out there, but it can happen, especially since we work with eating disorder clients. We have seen a lot of clients that chew an excessive amount of gum a packet or two or three, and that can really affect the gut. This can be from stress or it can be from trying not to eat. So we aren't really sure whether it's caused from the air being swallowed, the lack of nutrition since they're not eating, or because they are numbing out on the gum or because of the sugar alcohols. So if you chew a lot of gum, this might be an awareness check to see if this might be the cause of your excessive bloating or gas. 
Also, the speed in which you eat, eating quickly or chewing an excessive amount of gum. Either way, you're swallowing a lot of air. So again, this is an extreme, but it does happen. Another reason would be eating a diet that's extremely high in fiber. Now, I'm not saying for you to not consume fruits and vegetables or any fiber, but I definitely think that there is a misconception about how much fruit and veggies we need to be consuming. As a result, people are either not consuming any because they feel like they aren't doing a good enough job or they're consuming an excessive amount while restricting out necessary essential nutrients because of some diet culture BS. So if you can have balance of your nutrients, it honestly may decrease your bloating. Additionally, eating a large amount of sugar, alcohols, or sweeteners, like we mentioned earlier with the gum. I mean, this is in gum. It's also in some sugar-free diet items. It's in sweeteners, and it's in diet soda products. So these are sugar substitutes, aka fake sugars, not real sugar. And people tend to reach for these foods because of marketing and a diet mindset that they should, quote-unquote, decrease their sugar intake. But really, they actually can make you feel more bloated because as your stomach digests them, it produces more gas. And again, if it's consumed in an excessive amount because you're trying to always eat the diet foods, it just is probably way too much gas in your system. Yeah, you got toots magoots over here. (laughs) Chill out on the sweeteners, right? Yeah. Lastly, dehydration. I I know I mentioned this before, but it's so important. We need to make sure we are hydrated. So people people often use bloating and retention as interchangeable words. Even though not drinking enough water can feel like bloating, it is not excessive gas. Make sure that you are drinking fluids throughout the day and ones that are not diuretics like coffee. One common myth that I love to bust for people because it is something that often floats around diet culture misconceptions is that your stomach can shrink over time. Oh boy, here we go. Or that if you restrict, your stomach will shrink and you will lose weight and or eat less. Okay, this is not true. Your appetite may shrink, but the stomach is not shrinking. I'm going to explain more about what actually happens. So it's about to be summertime and maybe some of you some of you are going to be filling up water balloons for your kids. I will use this analogy. Picture a water balloon and pretend this water balloon is your stomach. What happens when we fill the balloon? What happens when we eat food? Our stomach is expanding and shrinking as you eat and digest your food, just like the water balloon does when we fill it with water and let the water out. So your stomach is a muscle, so these contractions are normal. So really your stomach is not changing, but the shape of it is shifting as it's being filled and as it's being emptied. Which would make sense then, if it feels like your stomach is filled with gas, the balloon is now growing and it's just full of gas. So that's why you feel bloated and you feel like the stomach and the belly area is quote unquote bigger, correct? Yeah. Okay. So this can obviously affect our digestion. I mean, since we know our stomach now does not change sizes, why does our digestion often feel better at different times? I mean, for example, when we're pregnant, we get full faster, we have acid reflux, and it's not because our stomach is smaller, but because we have more weight of the baby pushing on our stomach. And certain foods can also empty our system slower because they are more complex to break down and may cause us to feel full longer. So we're going to do a teensy bit of a tangent, but we want to chat about intermittent fasting real fast. Again, this could be an entire episode, but we often hear people want to try intermittent fasting because they're complaining of digestion issues or bloating, and diet culture's current promise is that intermittent fasting could fix that. We're going to use an analogy with intermittent fasting. And Rachel and I are not big fans and would never recommend this dietary restriction to anyone because we believe that a balanced relationship with food means you are listening to your body of when not to eat, when to eat, what you're craving, etc. So the more more rules, cough cough like intermittent fasting that you put on yourself, the more you disconnect from your body's signals. I really believe that people use or misuse really intermittent fasting for two reasons. One, for weight loss. They think if I don't eat, I'll lose weight. And I get the diet mindset that makes them feel this math makes sense. But really, your body will just adjust itself if it biologically needs to when you listen to it. Forcing your body to stop eating because the clock strikes a certain time is placing arbitrary rules on it. 
not listening to its rhythms and signals and it is just restricting dressed up for Halloween. Second, personally, I see a lot of people use intermittent fasting as a way to try to stop emotional eating behaviors that bother them. Like just like people hope that New Year's resolutions will give them, you know, motivation to stop a certain behavior. And if you want to know the stats of how that usually turns out, go back to our bonus episode of resolutions. Yes. I mean, you cannot set food rules onto heart issues. So food is pleasurable. Eating for emotional reasons is common and normal. Trust me, homeschooling, eating a lot of sour patch candies over here, and exploring where it feels like it is a negative coping skill, and then finding healing from what is the underlying reason that we use food to cope is a heart issue that needs to be done in therapy. It cannot be solved by just saying, I'm not going to eat for 10 to 12 hours or whatever. Please, please seek support from a therapist. If you feel food is something you are, quote unquote, out of control with, do not just stop eating for long periods of time and Google whatever research that you want to Google to try to figure out if this will solve digestive issues. Please don't. (laughs) Please. You're just going to be confused. That's just the reality. It's too much information that is incorrect and not designated to your individual needs. That's the reality. Right. Because whatever you Google is going to have tons of misconceptions about how it's going to reduce certain health risks or whatever. And the concept of this really, though, of intermittent fasting is really founded in just this concept of allowing your body to rest. I mean, when it's fatigued at the end of the night and trying to digest, Your digestive system and quote unquote gut brain is tired too. So it will decrease the amount of contractions like the balloon in your system. It could increase heartburn or reflux symptoms. It can decrease your metabolism. It disrupts your body's sleep and circadian clock. It alters your hormones to control your appetite. But your body will naturally work through its digestion as it's designed to do if you honor it and feed it regularly and then have a good night's sleep. Okay. So thank you, everyone, for sticking with that tangent. Now we're going to move on to our hormones because, honestly, hormones are internal genetic components. But for females, a hormonal shift usually impacts our stomach areas. The reason for this is because estrogen plays a big role in our fat storage and distribution. And as women, our stomachs, hips, and butts, hey, have three layers of fat while males only have one layer of fat. Interesting. A decrease in estrogen as we age leads to a slower metabolism, which may lead to weight gain in the abdominal area. But guess what? This is all normal. As we enter into menopause, it is expected that we should gain weight, and most often in the abdominal area. The reason being is that fat is a protection so that we can continue to produce estrogen. As we enter into menopause, estrogen decreases. We may need more fat so that we can continue to produce enough estrogen so that our body remains in its equilibrium. Mamas, this is okay. It is one of those areas of aging that we may not quote unquote love, but it is more helpful to work on accepting than fighting against it for the rest of your life. We have linked a really great article that goes into this a bit more. Check it out. Another reason is that testosterone levels also impact our abdominal area, and there are various hormonal disorders that lead to high levels of testosterone in women, and one marker of these is the growth of body hair and increase of muscle mass, both of which can impact the appearance of the belly. So as the therapist over here, hello, hello, I'm always fascinated by... (laughs) The impact of our emotional states on our physical bodies, also because I can't talk about the other things because I did not learn about them. But I mean, our body really does react to stress and trauma, and it can often react with a change in someone's body size. So let's go give the example of the impact of cortisol on our bodies. FYI, cortisol is your body's alarm or fight or flight system, and it's the main stress hormone. So it works with certain parts of your brain to control your mood, your motivation, and fear. Cortisol is released by the adrenal glands. It fluctuates throughout the day. It also stimulates carbohydrate and fat metabolism for quick energy and stimulates insulin release for blood sugar maintenance. Okay, very cool. It does a lot of things. So what happens when it's elevated? In elevated cortisol levels, the body will produce less testosterone, what Tina was just talking about, which means less muscle mass maintenance. 
So cortisol has been termed the stress hormone because it is secreted more often in physical or psychological stress, disrupting its normal fun- fluctuation throughout the day, higher in the morning, for example, or lower at night. So some studies have shown that the disruption of cortisol levels can determine where your body holds on to more fat, and often it's more in the belly and less in the hips. So stress is not the only reason, though, for elevated cortisol levels. There are diseases like Cushing syndrome that can affect cortisol release. And genetics, hello, genetics always play a big role. I mean, some people are just more sensitive to stress than others, therefore will release more cortisol compared to someone experiencing the same amount of stress. If you're really fascinated by all this fun education, please go back to episode four, Your Weight Part One, and you can learn all about the studies about the impact of trauma on weight. If you watch any films or read any articles about fat, or I'm going to swear here, the quote unquote obesity epidemic, I effing hate that word, then you will read all about the stigmatic and fat phobic side of how belly fat is extremely dangerous for health due to its impact on heart health and internal organs. I have even had clients tell me that her high school health teacher told her that her belly fat leads to fat lining the organs. So is this true? We are not medical doctors, obviously, but we have done a lot of research. And since we hold a health at every size paradigm, we are surrounded by literature that offers alternative studies and findings to offer a perspective that has far less fear mongering than the government and FDA would like us to read. But fortunately, Rachel and I live in this health at every size world because our professions and awareness, we also are aware of how to read research and understand where there are biases in the research. We recognize that there are many studies that also say the opposite of what we will share. But what we were trying to inform you of is our unbiased information so that you can make the informed decision for yourself. So let's bust the myth. Is belly fat as bad for your health as they say it is? Yeah, we're gonna tread very sensitively here to not trigger anyone. So to start, there are a few types of fat. 90% of people's body fat is subcutaneous. That means it's the layer of fat right below the skin. The other 10% is intra-abdominal body fat or visceral fat. This is the body fat that is woven around your organs. Now look, we all have both and it is necessary that we have both. As we age, we tend to build more visceral fat which pushes out our abdominal wall and makes it look like our bellies are growing. This visceral fat is essential, though, because it's an endocrine organ necessary to secrete specific hormones and other molecules. And without enough of this fat, then our bodies will not secrete these hormones. So Tina is going to give us a little bit more facts here. Yes. So one trigger to recognize is that visceral fat releases two proteins. This is going to get a little little wordy here, so hang with me, but cytokines and the precursor to angiotensin. So cytokines can trigger low level inflammation and angiotensin is a protein that causes blood vessels to constrict and blood pressure to rise. So researchers have found that our visceral visceral fat also releases a protein called retinol binding protein 4 or RBP4. Is he in Star Wars? No. Oh. <laughs> this is a molecule that increases insulin resistance. So there is a correlation between visceral fat and a number of diseases. However, it is not the causation. So we are still speaking from a health at every size standpoint here and want you to all understand that body fat cannot cause disease. If we are all taking care of our body, engaging in intuitive eating, gentle movement, stress management, and self-care, then our bodies will be at their equilibrium. And we are all meant to be different sizes. Our genetics may require us to hold on to a certain amount of visceral fat that is safe for our bodies. If you are noticing that over time this is changing and there are health concerns coming up, then I would recommend you go talk with your doctor, hopefully a weight-inclusive provider, to get more info. Weight loss is not the answer for better health because that is just the BS that diet culture serves us. And I think some of you might be confused by that statement because it feels like there are shows or there are articles you read or things you see of extreme examples of people's weight and feeling like, are you sure that it won't improve their health if they lose weight? So Tina, what do you say to that? We would still approach it in the same way, and we need to recognize that weight does not cause disease. Weight, BMI, the size of a person's body is not the causation for these disease struggles. 
We need to really take focus and recognize that every single person, every size, every shape, every color, every gender, everyone deserves proper health care. And so with that, we still take on the same approaches. Research shows that diets don't work. 95% of them fail. Well, I think you have an interesting point about health being from the inside out. For anyone who's taking an overall assessment of their health, it is an inside out perspective. Yes, my approach does not change based on someone's body size. I could literally hear people yelling at the podcast and being like, well, why not? And if that's your response, that's your work, right? That right there is diet culture and possibly some fat phobia screaming at you. And I would encourage you to reflect and do some internal work. And that's okay if it exists, but I'm just asking you to do that internal reflection. And if you want some science about it as well, we highly recommend you reading Christy Harrison's new book, Anti-Diet, where she really looks about looks at the skewed healthcare system and the history of weight loss in the medical community. Okay, our last point about bellies, if you're all still awake out there, is can our diet and exercise melt belly fat? Because even Pinterest can gets me on this whenever I'm just looking up random kids art activities. So this is a huge, huge thing that is advertised to us. So Tina, can you chat up with us about that for a hot second? Yeah, sadly enough, I have had many clients get sucked into the diet gimmicks of some BS company selling the idea that this machine can melt away belly fat by freezing it, burning it, lighting it on fire, who the hell knows. And it just makes me sad watching this happen because I can recognize the gimmick, but unfortunately, most people cannot. And I can tell you this right now, this shit is so expensive. These people are literally making a killing lying to people. These companies target those individuals that are so dissatisfied with their bodies, their bellies, that they are willing to try any trick to get rid of it. Well, mamas, I'm going to save you a ton of money here. There is nothing that will melt away your body fat unless you physically remove it, which even that will have it come back. There is no way to get rid of it in a quick fix kind of way. Even if you were to somehow force your body to get rid of fat, which I really don't recommend, you cannot target lose. So if you're trying to target lose in the belly, I'm sorry, but it really just isn't possible. Yeah, and because we want to continue to provide the facts, we did a little bit more research on this, and I'm going to read for you real fast what we found. So what we found is that women tend to have 6 to 11% more body fat than men. We also know that women tend to burn fat more efficiently during exercise. However, they hold on to more body fat. Another fact we learned was that women tend to have more mitochondria than men, And the hormone estrogen tends to be the cause of that. I feel like estrogen is to blame for everything. It is. (laughs) The bottom line, I don't know, estrogen. Just blame it on estrogen. So if women's cells have more mitochondria, oh, by the way, do you guys remember that in the cell in seventh grade where you had to like name the parts? It looked like the little bean. Oh my gosh. That was my favorite little part of the cell. Okay, so that little bean, that's mitochondria. And mitochondria in women tend to be more metabolically active, meaning they can burn more energy. However, over time, especially during menopause, remember, thanks to estrogen, this hormone decreases, which can cause the change for a metabolic shift in women as they age. There was a recent research study at UNSW, St. George Clinical School, and they were examining why women were holding on to more fat. So from an energy standpoint, there should be no reason that women have more fat because men will consume more nutrition on average. And this study showed that even women tend to burn more fat during exercise, however, continue to hold on to more body fat. So the purpose of the study was to find out why. And the conclusion of the study was that it was due to our lovely hormone estrogen again. Estrogen. However, there is research that shows that women tend to hold on to more body fat around their hips and their thighs for the purpose of childbirth, whether or not you're planning on birthing a child or not, your body doesn't really know that, versus men who tend to hold on to more fat in the stomach area. Another quick component about belly fat and melting fat for you moms that we thought you might like is the answer to the question, is it normal to hold on to belly fat while nursing? Ooh, 
Hey, me over here. I'm going to tell you a bit about prolactin. So this hormone is essential during breastfeeding, but it also increases our appetite. I mean, that makes sense, right? Because we are producing food for another human. So this is the body's way of taking care of us. If we are expending energy to make this food, then we need a hormone to tell us to eat more. And that is prolactin. So in a study comparing new moms, breastfeeding, and non-breastfeeding moms, the non-breastfeeding moms lost more fat in the initial six months postpartum than the breastfeeding moms. Conclusion was the result of prolactin being produced in the breastfeeding moms in order to keep up their milk supply and increase their appetite. I enjoyed reading on this topic because I hear a lot of moms say that they are going to breastfeed so that they can lose the baby weight quicker. While I try to encourage all clients and people that I interact with to make decisions for their bodies that do not include weight loss or body change, I definitely think a decision like breastfeeding should exclude wanting to lose weight. I hope this can help some of you mamas that are on the fence about whether or not to breastfeed, that you are more likely to hold on to your pregnancy weight during the process of breastfeeding so that you can continue to support your growing baby. Okay, guess what, everyone? If you're still conscious and if you're still listening, we made it to the end of our education. So now we are going to go into some of the body acceptance piece because understanding your genes with a G means you can have so much awe and appreciation for your body. I mean... Everything we just covered is an amazing machine that we have no choice in. I mean, literally, the body just shows up for us every day, working, digesting, burning, and loving us, keeping us alive, and operating the best it can. Your body loves you, even if you don't love your body. So as helpful as education can be, we know you probably want some what do I do next tips. So since our goal for you is to heal from the inside out, Here are some ways to do that based on each piece we just covered. Okay. If you feel that your belly is bloating more often than not, we suggest being mindful of your behaviors, check in with your body, hydrate, and assess lifestyle choices like alcohol, smoking, stress level, etc. to look for patterns that might mean your digestive system is having an aversion to something. We encourage you to look beyond your food since hopefully you know and can understand that bloating and these signals are eons more beyond what we are eating. And then if your hormones are feeling off based on physical symptoms you are experiencing, try to find a weight-inclusive dietitian and medical doctor that can help you read your labs, find a specialist, and take the steps needed with supplements, medications, or lifestyle changes, not the diet culture ones that can balance you out and teach you about your body, or a trauma therapist that can really help you heal your psychological wounds. If you feel that you are starting to hold on to weight in your stomach, we encourage you to assess if your hormones are changing and if you are entering menopause or a different stage in life. If your body is digesting food differently and reacting differently. If you are not getting enough sleep. Or if you need to see a therapist to help you manage your stress. Not because you need to diet and get rid of this weight, but because... As we age, we may need to be easier on our bodies by listening to them and honoring them differently. And if you are feeling the pressure to melt that belly fat, know that any exercise or diet you try with that goal in mind will quickly fail or be a fad diet that won't work long term. Finding joyful movement, exercise that energizes your body and soul, and movement that connects your family. Listen to episodes 14 and 15, your exercise parts 1 and 2 for ideas. will keep your blood flowing your inner and outer strength growing, and your soul flourishing. Gentle nutrition is key to living your best life as well. So having the all foods fit mentality of knowing that there is a time and place for dessert as well as veggies will allow you to listen to your body and honor its signals. By letting go of the diet mentality and the pressure to shrink that waist size, you actually might just find yourself craving salad some days and ice cream the next and truly finding food peace. Mamas, we know that society will feed you the lie that your belly is not acceptable and should be flat as a board or ultimately determines your worth as a person. And we are here to help you bust that shame. Own your softness, recognize your aging, your changing body, and know that health is not defined by your six pack, but by your joy and well-rounded living. Thank you again for taking the time to educate yourselves and engage in some mental self-care by listening to this episode. So our takeaway question for you today is, what steps do you need to take to heal from the inside out? We will see you next time. 
Thank you. This episode of Mom Jeans was produced and edited by Rachel Coleman and Tina LaBoy. Just a reminder, this episode is not a substitute for therapeutic counsel or nutrition advice. Thank you to Jerry DePizzo for the music production. You can find episode information and show notes at www.momjeansthepodcast.com. Follow us on Instagram at momjeansthepodcast and join the Mom Jeans the Podcast Facebook group to find a community of mamas learning to love their bodies and discussing the episodes. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Mom Jeans. See you next time.